welcome to episode number 228 of CXO Talk. I'm Michael Krigsman, an industry analyst and the host of CXO Talk. We have, again, just another amazing show. We are going to be talking about augmented reality and mixed reality and virtual reality and artificial intelligence by two people who are among the most expert in the world on these topics. Before we begin, I want to say thank you to Livestream for being a great supporter of CXO Talk. I used to use Google Hangouts and I hated Google Hangouts because it crashed and there was no support and there were bugs and Livestream saved us. And if you go to livestream.com slash CXO Talk, they'll give you a discount. There's a Hey guys, hey guys, hang on, hold on, hold on. There's a tweet chat that's going to be taking place right now with the hashtag CXO Talk. And so without further ado, I want to introduce Robert Scoble and Shell Israel. And uh, Robert Scoble. Oh, yeah. all right. I thought you were the amazing ant man. <laughs> all right. So Robert Scoble, uh, tell us what you're wearing. I'm wearing a Microsoft HoloLens, which is the first of the mixed reality uh, devices that are going to hit the market. But obviously, this is not yet ready for consumers. It's way too big, way too dorky, and way too expensive. But it does show you the future, and it's a, an amazing future, um, and we're going to talk about it. Yeah, I'm a tech journalist. Uh, Siri was launched on that couch back here. I had the first ride in the first Tesla. I've been covering Silicon Valley for many years now. And uh, Shell and I have written three books. Each book has uh, uh, predicted a decade long trend. At, and this latest book called The Fourth Transformation uh, predicts I, augmented reality is going to change everything. And this week, uh, Snap and Facebook uh, demonstrated that principle pretty well. OK, so we're going to be talking about these things and the latest developments in augmented reality. Shell Israel, uh, you and I have known each other for many years, as I've also known Robert. Welcome to CXO Talk. This is your first time here. I've known you ever since I lost my coat in Boston, Massachusetts, and you gave me this beautiful marmon. And I have to tell you, Mike, after 10 years, my friendship with you has outlasted that coat. I'm partners with Robert Scoble and Transformation Group. Um, it's a new... Um, consulting service for large brands primarily. Uh, we're going to help them make the transformation into mixed reality, and we can use the rest of the show to explain what mixed reality is all about. Yeah, yeah okay, so so let's begin. You guys, you guys have written this, a, a, a new book on AI, augmented, on augmented reality and artificial intelligence. You've started a consulting company called the Transformation Group. So let's let's level set. And when you talk about AR, VR, mixed reality, what are, what are we actually talking about? Can, can I set that up? Um, so VR, first of all, you're in a black box and you're only seeing virtual things, right? You're not seeing the real world at all. With AR uh, or augmented reality, you can today use your phone like on Snapchat or on Facebook just came out and aim it at things and see virtual things on top of the world. Soon you're going to be wearing glasses and soon being in the next three to four years, you're going to see a range of glasses from companies like Apple, Facebook, Huawei, uh, Snap. Uh, there's 10 under development that Shell and I know about, and we probably don't know about all of them. And that will lock the image, the virtual image to the real world and let you walk around it and that and that and interact with it and that's uh really mind-blowing i mean with the hololens you can have aliens coming out of your walls and they're blowing holes in your real wall you're seeing the real wall but it looks like there's an alien coming through it and it's quite mind-blowing what this technology does for education for retail for all sorts of different things shell israel uh why what is all why does this all matter What's, what's it, what are the implications? Well, well, that gets to the core of the four transformations. I'm not going to walk through the whole thing, but <clears throat> the first transformation, we started putting words into uh, PCs on knowledge worker desktops. Uh, desktops. Um, 
in, in the form of personal computers. Then we went to point and click with the Macintosh, and that meant everyone could use these desktop things. Then we went to touch and mobility, and that brought us into what is now this third transformation where anyone is using uh, digital technology everywhere. Now we're going to go to a system which is much more intimate uh, than what we have with phones. We're going to have things in a few years that look like the glasses I'm wearing. And they are going to allow us to do all the things Robert just named, AR, MR, VR. And we're not going to look freakish and we're not going to be tethered to anything. This means that the customer experience in stores is going to be changed because they can do things in 3D. They will walk into stores, be at home, and have an immersive experience with a product. This means that um, surgeons can get assistance while wearing headsets. It means that uh, anatomy students will uh, be doing virtual surgeries uh, ra uh, 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 in headsets rather than with frozen cadavers. Um, every single place we look, there will be virtual teachers in China at least. Um, students will learn what it looks like, uh, what the Civil War was like, not by memorizing the name of a battle and by dates, but by actually going to Gettysburg and getting the full impact of what a bloody war is like. Uh, wherever you look, whatever you do, it's going to be enhanced with the mixed reality technologies. And Robert, you are out seeing these companies. You've been traveling around the world. And tell us, tell us uh, what are some of the really fascinating examples that you've seen and, and who's, who's doing this really well? Well, it, it goes it goes way back in 2011. I did I think the first interview for our book, and that was with Matteo in Germany, and they showed me monsters on the sides of skyscrapers with a, a standard camera, and we still haven't seen that ship. And Apple bought that company, and so I expect when Apple comes in this world, we're going to see stuff like that in in its mixed reality strategy that it's uh, developing. Um, and it's quite an expansive strategy. It goes back to Steve Jobs. Right? Uh, they've been working on this for more than seven years, and they still haven't shipped the product yet, which shows the kind of investment that it takes, not just to do it at Apple, but even at Meta. You know, I, I did an interview this week, week at Meta, which is one of the first uh, mixed reality glass co glasses companies that Shell and I have been interviewed. And um, they've been doing it for five years, and, and their product it is still not there to where a consumer can wear it and use it all day long. Why are these uh, products so expensive to develop? All transformative products through history are very expensive to develop. I remember when Windows came out, Bill Gates said that the first uh, version of Windows, the first copy cost over a billion dollars. The second one cost 75 cents. This is still in the hardware phase. Uh, we are now looking at state-of-the-art stuff, which will soon be quaint things to look at in computer museums in Boston and San Jose. <clears throat> and we will end up wearing something that costs under 200 bucks, I would imagine, which does infinitely more than we can imagine today, the same way um, our smartphones do infinitely more than mainframes did 50 years earlier, <clears throat> except the transformation isn't going to take 50 years. It's going to take less than 10 for sure, maybe five, maybe even less, <clears throat> because so much money from so many great companies is going into this technology. So right now, it looks to us like it's all moving in slow motion. But when you think of the technology going into this, the things that have never been done before that can now be done, the, the changes from what we saw a year ago at South by Southwest to where we are now, this was a marvel. The thing, Robert, that I just made fun of 
was a marvel when it first came out. But now just about everybody that I know that wears it, that loves it, talks about their frustration with it because it's heavy, it's cumbersome, it's got a limited field of view. There are so many problems being solved at such a rapid rate when you're a consumer yeah. or you, you're, you're trying to figure out what pro technologies you should use the next quarter in the enterprise <clears throat> or for a brand, th then it seems very slowly. But this is the fastest technology revolution of the four of them by orders of magnitude. You, you asked, why does this cost so much to build? Let's talk about like the six technologies that are on this thing, yeah. right? Sensors that are seeing the world, th that is billions of dollars of R&D, right? Prime Sense uh, was bought by Apple. Uh, Google Tango is doing the same kind of research. Meta is doing the same kind of, everybody who wants to build a mixed reality glass has to build sensors that see the world in 3D and bring it into the glass. Then you talk about the, the five, the, the connectivity that you're going to need, right? Because with mixed reality glasses, you get as many TV screens around you as you want. So imagine being able to watch CNN here and here ESPN is playing. And over here, you can watch uh, your security cameras from your business. And over here, you can watch Amazon servers. And over here, you can watch Facebook. And you just look around, you have dozens of screens all around you. And you don't need to buy more if you want more screens. But to to serve all those screens with high res 4K or 8K video eventually, or you know even more in, in the future, you're gonna need a lot of bandwidth and that's 5G. 5G brings 35 gigabits per second down to the glasses, but we don't yet have 5G and we're gonna, and Verizon has to redo the architecture on, on a city because the cell tower needs to be in a, a kilometer and a half uh, from you or closer. And that's not true with today's uh, cell technology. You can be 15 kilometers away. So they need to put a lot more cell towers into a city and put fiber into each one of those uh, antennas that is going to bring us 5G. That's coming this year, right? Uh, uh, Verizon is turning on the first 11 cities this year. Um, and that's billions of dollars. Uh, you, you go through the GPU. The GPU is needed to display the polygon. So when you are seeing virtual things in VR or AR, you're seeing millions of little polygons or little triangles that are underneath what you're seeing. And the, you need a better GPU to process more of those. So if you wanna increase the resolution or increase the frame rates or increase the experience of being immersed in the media, you need more GPU, or you need to do a lot of trickery with foveated rendering. And you look at the R&D budgets of NVIDIA and AMD and Qualcomm and Huawei and other companies that are building these chips, they're spending billions of dollars per quarter in R&D. Then you, uh, you, know, you keep looking around, there's companies that are building eye sensors. Google bought iFluence that's in our book. Uh, Facebook bought a company called iTribe. There's lots of money being spent on, on that and particularly in the new u uh, user interfaces that you're gonna be experiencing when you get a glass like this. They're, they're in investing there. Just, just, and you just keep moving down the stack. The whole thing is just really expensive. And, and there, there's 10 companies building these glasses and they're all building their own uh, uh, infrastructure. And, and the infrastructure, Apple is building a CDN. So think about putting a, a server near you so that you have low latency VR. That, you know, you can play football with your friends over, over the internet, right? That requires a CDN that's a, a really a massive a new in expenditure for Apple and other companies. Yeah, yeah, Michelle. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, j just an example. There's, everybody's looking at the mass acceptance, but there are all these verticals that require remarkably new technology. <laughs> Excuse me. MindMay is a company that we wrote about in the book has $1.2 billion in um, investment money. What they're doing with this money is creating a virtual reality headset to cure <clears throat> schizophrenia, to treat um, stroke, uh, to help people recover from stroke, to treat Parkinson's, there's about five or six of these really complex um, ailments that they're addressing and finding success with. Uh, to do this, they're creating 30, uh, a net that goes over the head, it contains 32 sensors that are reading directly from the brain. It is using 
the patient's brain to move objects, to make somebody whose arm has been cut off believe that arm is still there to eliminate the pain. Every single thing I mentioned is something that's never been done in history. They've been working on this stuff for four years. They're burning a lot of money, but when you consider what they're working at and that they will probably have cured, I'm guessing, schizophrenia in the next four or five years, that's kind of remarkable. When you think of the billions of dollars that will save the pain and suffering that will be reduced, the investment that is going in here is enormous, but the return is even greater, far greater. <clears throat> and the time to make this stuff may seem very long, but when you think of what they're doing, it's rather short. So the sense that I have is the there's this e enormous promise and the ability to change fields as, as diverse as medicine, learning, training, in profound ways, and yet at the same time, in order for this promise to be realized, there needs to be a massive investment in, in infrastructure, in wireless connectivity. Let, let's <clears throat> talk about one that you're gonna hear a lot more about. Facebook was the first one to use this term on stage in a big way, in a big company way, and that's SLAM. Uh, so what we're really building is a artificial copy. What does SLAM stand for, Robert? Simultaneously, lo simultaneous location and mapping, which means we're building a 3D map of the world. And, and it's not a map like Google Maps where there's just a line in the middle of the street, but it's capturing the entire street in 3D. And we're not just going to capture the street. We're going to capture every surface in the world with these glasses and build a massive database. How big is that database gonna be? Petabytes or exabytes, some, some massive amount of server space just to keep a 3D copy of the world at some resolution, you know, let's say a millimeter per pixel or voxel resolution around you. That's a huge amount of data. And, and that's a billion dollars right there just in a data center, right, to start with. And it might be three or four billion once you're all done. And, it, and certainly you're gonna have to change those machines out every you know, uh, 36 months, just like you do with cloud computing machines at, at Amazon, for instance. Um, so th that's right there, that's a billion dollar business at minimum. And Uber's building one of those copies, Mercedes is building one of those copies, Google built already one of those copies, uh, Apple's building one of those copies, Facebook is working on this, right? That's what they were showing off when they said, oh, you can lock virtual things onto your tabletop. That's using SLAM, so they built a, the, the phone instantly builds a point cloud and a 3D model of the world and then starts doing AI to try to figure out how to lock things properly to the surfaces in your room. Uh, and that's going to be something that over the next 18 months, you're going to see a lot more of because right now we haven't seen any of the really good AI that recognizes the objects in your room, but that's coming and it's coming big time according to Google uh, because they're going to use the data that they built off the self-driving cars to bring <laughs> to our glasses. And how many, th how many objects in the street does the Google self-driving car or now Wago recognize? I figure it's hundreds of thousands of things, right? Because it needs to see a stop sign or a stoplight and know what to do. And the glasses are going to do the same thing when you walk around. It's going to tell you stuff about the world that you're looking at. What's the time frame for all of this? Is it, it seems like it must be years away still. Um, it, Apple is going to announce something this year. Um, we'll see how, how aggressive they are, but I bet they're going to be very aggressive, particularly since Facebook set a, such an aggressive tone for this AR world, um, that the com big companies are going to keep trying to outdo the, each other. The question is, when do we get glasses? And uh, certainly within the next two years. Uh, within the next two years, you're going to see 10 glasses uh, get unleashed uh, from a variety of different companies, maybe three years if, if you want to include uh, more players, but Apple's coming within two years. So within two years, I, me and Shell are wearing little Apple glasses that you know might have a limited field of view. We don't know. We don't know how good their optics are. Um, and then you're going to see a but, lot of others. But uh, however good they are, there will be like nothing that's ever been experienced before. It's true. Every time, everybody who plays with my HoloLens is just absolutely floored by by how 
uh, amazing it is to have computing on all the surfaces of your house. You know, it just, uh, it, it's, it, it, you got to experience you need, you need to picture another factor. We're talking all about the technology, but let's switch over to the humans for a while. Because right now, we sit around, we can tell, I was there when the Commodore pet was blah, 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 blah. Right now, the starting point for coming generations is that old thing called the smartphone. That's the starting point. We have kids using Minecraft uh, who are learning to code before kindergarten. They're learning to share. They're learning to, uh, to, to, to... when they want to learn something, they don't go to teachers or parents or, 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 or handbooks. They go to YouTube. So we have a culture whose expectation as they grow up will be to use VR and AR in their work as they shop for their entertainment. Everything that they do, they're going to expect VR and AR Rather than, you know, my generation started off with typewriters and carbon paper. And can you imagine being a, a recent grad and sitting down in an office and being handed an Underwood manual typewriter and uh, white out uh, today? That's what's going to happen if you hand somebody 10 years from today, a recent graduate, a smartphone. They're going to look at this thing and say, what is this? My grandmother used this. Yeah. So. You need to look at not only the evolution of the technology, but generations that are rising, which is a great time, Robert, for you to talk about the zero learning curve generation that you discovered. Yeah, uh, you know, because I have, in fact, one of our uh, piece of advice to brands who are seeing that this world is starting to come at them and they're starting to wonder what they should be doing about it, particularly when Facebook is doing it. If you don't pay attention to what Facebook's doing, with augmented reality for brands, it's uh, pretty stunning. So um, my advice is to get VR today because you know there's not enough experiences on on augmented reality to to really have a good experience. And you need to start building and understanding how to build for VR because that's going to teach you how to think how your engineering teams and your and your strategy teams should be thinking in 3D uh, and starting to think about the, the next world. I have to stick in the commercial pitch. This is why we started Transformation Group, that um, we don't think there are too many decision makers in, at, in, in brand, high-level brand seats, <clears throat> feeling the great pain of an unfulfilled demand for MR, MR, uh, mixed reality technologies. Yeah. <clears throat> but we think it's going to come sooner than people realize. And it is very important for a brand to stay a little ahead of their customers, a little ahead of their competitors, and certainly far enough ahead that no young entrepreneur says, ha, ah, I see an opportunity to unseat a big taxi company or Sears Roebuck of today. If companies sit and wait for the best cases to come out, it means that somebody will have beaten them to, to the page. And what the race is really for is the next generation of customers. And obviously you guys feel that this is going to just explode in popularity and adoption in the world in what, the next three years, four years? What's the time frame? Yeah. Well, Go ahead, Robert. It's now. This week, Facebook and Snap laid out really expansive strategies for this. And if you're not paying attention to that, you're going to get slammed every month because over the next 24 months, you're going to see 10 glasses come out and big companies come out with major new strategies around this. Apple is the one that I'm looking at the most. And Tim Cook has been out there talking about AR for a year now. Now we have a question. Does he ship this year? Does he ship next year? Does he ship in 2019? But certainly by the end of 2019, everybody's in the game. And so if you're running a, a business today, you have to start thinking about how your customers in three years are going to experience your business as they walk in and, or as they call you in, the, in a, you know, uh, from this mixed reality world and what the experience expectation is going to be. Explosion's a funny word, Mike. I, I think it's more like when Ethernet came in. Um, Bob Metcalf used to say for the first year in a row, up to the seventh year in a row, this will be the year of the network. 
No one really knows when the year of the network was. No one really knows what moment the smartphone replaced the laptop. This is going to be more like a river flowing very, very quickly. And if you just start getting your arms around this now, if you're trying something out, when this is already happening, you have a very long learning curve. What you're doing is transforming the way businesses operate, the way they deal with partners, customers, uh, marketing, everything. And there is a lot to learn. And if you start waiting to see what the other guys are doing, then you're going to be a laggard to market. You're in, in the, going to be in the same position as Kmart or J.C. Penney. You know, it, 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 it's the companies that make the trend. We think in retail, it's very interesting. Home Depot has long been perceived as a technology leader in its category. And what's going on now is Lowe's has come up with a holodeck for kitchen redesign. Uh, they're selling uh, Tango technology phones from Lenovo, not as phones, but as home improvement tools, where $500 to save you the cost of mis uh, uh, making a mistake and remodeling your house isn't that expensive. Um, so there is an example of where I think one company that is perceived as the follower is going to become a leader. And I don't think there's any way that Home Depot today can adjust course and catch up because Lowe's has been at it for two years. And we have a comment from Twitter, Jay Farrow, who is a prominent CIO and has been a healthcare CIO, makes the comment that he sees huge applicability in healthcare patient and for both patients and providers, as well as construction, security, and others. So maybe can you talk about the healthcare applications of AR VR and mixed reality? Um, yeah, Pfizer sees it as a drug and they're already doing studies along the lines of what Shell talked earlier about that uh, they're, they're studying it for use in Alzheimer's, ADHD, uh, autism, um, depression, and physical pain, among other things. So first of all, putting light in your eyes turns out it's a brain hack and it can affect your brain. It can change your brain. And we are already seeing examples of this in studies. Uh, the University of Washington studied burn victims uh, and they put VR on the burn victims and compared their responses to pain uh, via VR versus uh, morphine. And they found VR is way more effective at solving burns, uh, at pain than morphine. It so, may be just as addictive, but it isn't. It doesn't have the side effects in that addiction. No, and and right. morphine takes you down. You know, opiates take you down a path of. If you go all the way down the path, you end up in heroin. This is one of the reasons we have a huge heroin problem uh, in America, and we're killing people. Well, a lot of people in this addiction, and. Um, if we can stop that or, or cut that down by moving some of these uh, things away from opiates uh, and into uh, using light in your eyes to affect your brain, that's really a big deal. Um, where else are we going to go with this? The doctors are going to wear it. I just had my eyes scanned in 3D. That's the first time, you know, just last Saturday, I had my first uh, 3D eye scan done. So now the doctor is going to be able to walk around the surface of my eye, uh, you know, in 3D, you know, with her glasses. A, a couple more in this area, because I think health and healthcare is one of the places that is going to be um, for me, it's remarkable because we've written three books and health was always a laggard. They were busy thinking about maybe we won't have to carry around our records in manila folders from one doctor to the other. And now suddenly they're at the leading edge. It, 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 outside of Boston at Dusan, a company that's designed 3D modeling for Tesla and Boeing, uh, uh, they've developed a uh, a... 3D heart, which is a thousand times bigger than a real heart, a much larger. Doctors can go there with, with, with a 3D model of a patient's heart where they can't find the problem and tour, take a 3D tour of a heart and see what the affliction in, 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 in the patient's heart is by seeing what a perfectly healthy heart will look like. Um, in uh, Case Western is using HoloLens 
to teach med students anatomy so that they don't have to um, uh, cut up cadavers, which I think I might have mentioned before. But um, every aspect of healthcare is working that way, and we're just beginning. One of the possible dangers of all of this is one of the uh, sources of miracles. VR and AR impacts how the human brain works. It can make pain go away. We don't know what the lasting effects is. We don't know what is going to happen when millions of people start having their brains somewhat adjusted by this stuff. But in terms of health, it can only help. But when you say it makes pain go away, just you have to elaborate on that because what that implies is that VR, AR operate on centers in the brain that are related to things like pain, but that are very different mechanisms than when we take drugs. And so I'm so I'm, I'm skeptical. So so tell us. There's an eye doctor in South Africa. Her name's Cheryl Lee Calder. She runs iGym.com and she works with professional athletes. And all she does is put light into their eyes and she fixes them. She took the worst rider on the South African cycling team in terms of falls per race. He played with her app for 10 minutes a day for six months. And now he's best on the team at that task. And she has dozens of examples of this. It shows how deeply uh, hackable our brains are and how we, little we really know about the brain, but we're doing a lot of research. You know, Mind Maze is one, but is Elon right? Musk just announced uh, that he's doing brain research because he knows that you're gonna inter interface with things with your brain. And uh, Facebook just announced the same thing, that they're doing brain research because they think you can think a post and have it appear, right? Mm -hmm. Or uh, something else, right? Drugs have been hacking brains for a very long time. Psychedelic drugs, you know, we all can talk about it, acid or LSD. But it goes back hundreds of years where natives have been using mescalito in the desert, as the Don Juan books told us about. We have been using drugs to alter sections of the brain for a very long time. We have been concerned about the side effects of that. Uh, Robert talked about morphine to heroin. Uh, there are countless reports, not countless, I have seen reports about what has happened to veterans who became uh, addicted to drugs when they were being treated for pain that suffered a battle wound. And they become homeless guys on the street with heroin addiction because their brain never got out of the addiction. Now, we can do this without the medication. It may have the same or a different impact on, on, on the human brain. We do know there are at least four companies who are talking about replacing morphine and other opiates in surgery. This sounds to me like cause for optimism because of the dangers of opiates, particularly in teenagers. Um, there's reports, I think, Robert, you're the source of that, reports on teenagers having surgery, becoming addicted to morphine and other opiates. This may not happen with AR and VR, and I can't tell you what will or will not happen because it's all too new, but it certainly sounds better to me. And if I had a choice of putting on a VR headset and swimming around with the seahorses at the Great Barrier Reef while they're doing open heart surgery, rather than risking my life with, 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 with uh, vapors going up my nostrils, I would pick the glasses and the Great Barrier Reef. Are you aware of any uh, medical research studies uh, that are using AR, VR mixed reality in, in controlled studies? Has that happened yet? University of Washington, and if you search VR pain, uh, you'll find it vrpain.com. We what what about <clears throat> excuse me what about the artificial intelligence aspect? We have a comment from Arsalan Khan on Twitter, who says these technologies can also create biases and perhaps perhaps make us more lonely 
through technology and the whole bias question brings up i don't buy the loneliness pro uh, uh at all if you play with facebook spaces that just got released this week you can do a incredible things with people over the internet and now start thinking about making that mixed reality where you're walking around and you can play frisbee with your best friend or you can work on a work project with a team all in 3d all standing around a table without me leaving my my bedroom here that's incredible and uh and uh, people have been saying oh this stuff is going to desensitize people i just don't buy that it, it, I've been watching a lot of people play VR at Upload VR. I've had an officer for a year. I wore Google Glass for a year before that. I've been studying this a while, and I just do not see any signs of that. There will be downsides. In, in our book, we have lots of uh, uh, examples of downsides. The longest chapter in the book is what could possibly, called What Could Possibly Go Wrong. A lot of things. Just watch yeah. Black Mirror, and you see the downsides <clears throat> Oh, but Mike, you, you know, right now we're sitting here and I see these three boxes. I see four boxes. One is a black box that just says your name in it. Um, but picture in the future, we're located remotely from each other, but we're all sitting in each other's rooms talking to each other. Uh, I might punch Robert in the shoulder and he feels the impact of that through uh, haptic technology. Um, you know, I can toss a Frisbee over to you, Mike, and you can retrieve it and toss it over to Robert, and we see the Frisbee coming at us. So now we can play, we can be social with people all over the world. Take something like, like Minecraft, which is teaching kids who have no, are completely apathetic to global politics, which make me envious of them. They're sharing code with kids in countries that we're in hostile relationships with. You know, it, it's you can find people like yourself all over the world. You can play with them. You can study with them. You can adventure with them. You can zap aliens with them. You can zap each other with them. You can play ping pong, frisbee. And this is just the beginning. Uh, Ten years ago, we had the horrors of WebEx, which was a miracle at the time, and all the 14 steps to get in and out of it. And now we just click and look how far we've gone since uh, uh, Google, Google Plus, which you made fun of at the beginning of this program. Think of where we're going to be two years from today when the screen's gone and we're just sitting here. We're not wearing headphones. We're just looking at each other. I, it's funny. I just started looking at you in my room here. But that's what it's going to be like. Every phone conversation, I know phone conversations are getting outdated, um, but every phone conversation is going to be without a screen separating us. We're going to be there. We're going to be socializing with each other. And the issue of place becomes almost not totally irrelevant, but almost irrelevant, more irrelevant. We we have really just a few minutes left. This conversation has gone by so fast, and I, and I wish we had another hour. But we have not spoken about the AI, the artificial intelligence connection. And so please bring that in. Where does that fit? So when, when your glasses sense the world in 3D, it sees planes like your wall, your ceiling, your table, your floor but it doesn't know really anything about those planes. And the AI is gonna recognize all the objects in your world, including the planes, right? So it'll really know that is the floor. And when it, when it knows that, then you can have artificial things moving around your world because it's gonna know every surface. So aliens can come out of the walls if you want that. Uh, you can have assistants sitting on your table helping you do things. You can have a SpongeBob jumping around back here, you know, something like that. And you're starting to see tastes of this with the new Snapchat and new Facebook functionality where they're augmenting your face or they're augmenting the world and putting things onto the world, right? But the world is stupid today. Uh, five years from now, the world is going to be really smart. The, the, these glasses are going to know everything about the things that it's seeing because this is how the self-driving car sees the world. And, and this is the systems that are going to be put in place to see this uh, stuff. Or a surgeon or, 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 a, or a surgeon in the middle of surgery. I, can, I mean, incredible. Well, you know, 
I'm thinking just the mixed reality stuff. The surgeon is going to have a robotic sur uh, surgery machine that's going to be training on his work or her work and is going to assist that surgeon in, in doing uh, sutures, for instance, or doing whatever they need to do, you know, scoping your knee or whatever. And they, the doctors are training the machines to do the work. <laughs> so that's a huge trend and bigger than just a, a few minutes that we I'm, I'm okay, just one nice. more thing about remote surgery, which is if you're in a tent in a battlefield and suddenly you have to do an emergency heart valve replacement, somebody at John Hopkins can be watching the surgery over your shoulder and say, uh uh, uh not that one, yeah. and save lives that way. Um, the possibilities are great, and that is the same application as an oil rig worker being trained in a corporate headquarters, what to do when a fire breaks out in the North Sea or in the Gulf of Mexico, as we've experienced in this country. I mean, clearly there's, the, my mind has certainly been opened hugely. So we have really just about three minutes left. And in, that, in our last couple of minutes, what advice do you have for brands? I mean, you, you alluded to some things earlier. What should brands be doing today in order to make sure that they are ready? The, pro the problem for brands is when they, they don't know how to dream about a world that's coming really fast. Um, that's very different to today's world. Uh, and so you need to start getting into VR or getting a HoloLens and start really thinking through strategically how your business is going to be changed by these technologies. Sephora, for instance, already is doing augmented reality signs in the, in the stores. And they're already building augmented reality on their Apple app to augment makeup onto your face. So you can try out pink lipstick, for instance, in, uh, on the Sephora app on the iPhone or on uh, Android. And they're already playing with this so that when the glasses come along, they're going to already have their engineering teams geared up and they're already going to have a good idea of how they're going to build things and what they're going to build and they're going to be able to build it iteratively and nicely. Right now, a, a Unity developer is fairly cheap. In a year, that the Unity developer is going to cost three times more than it does today. So if you convince that Unity developer to come and join your team today, you're going to get them cheaper or cheaper That's a deal. than you will in a year. Because in a year, Apple and Facebook and Google and Snap are going to really wake everybody up. I mean, I, if, if that's the lesson of this week, you, companies need to wake up to the fact that this stuff is becoming real and really fast. And you need to get it. it, it. I, I just wanted to end with just a touch of shameless self-promotion that Robert and I are offering educational workshops to brands to understand what is going on now, to see how other companies in their fields are starting to use this and help them understand that they need to pay attention now. They don't need to move now. They don't have to start offering headsets when you walk through the door. But we can help them understand what is happening that is relevant yeah. to them, not this quarter, but maybe eight quarters down the line. You also, one, one really deep change, because your brand is going to be sprayed onto the world, right? You're going to walk into a hotel into a hotel in five years, and the hotel is going to be augmented. Disneyland is going to be augmented. They're already working on it. Right. So your customers are going to walk in with Apple or Facebook or Google Glasses or Snap Glasses and, and things are going to be augmented in the park when you walk around. Um, so so you're going to have to build a new kind of team that hasn't existed. And it's a cultural review team because you're going to make mistakes in this new world it, that are cultural. You might piss off Trump supporters, for instance. Well, that's a lot of people to piss off. So you've got to run a diverse team of people through your software the same way you run a diverse t group of people through to make sure you don't have bugs and crashes, to make sure you don't make cultural mistakes, make sure there's no Nazi symbols on the walls anywhere that snuck through the design process. This stuff happens, but you need to have a team to work on this. So that's the kind of strategic thinking that I, I'm starting to think that companies need, but they aren't investing in this because they haven't even started thinking about it yet. And to, to, 
first stage is you got to get into VR or into the HoloLens and start playing around and really understand how fast this market is moving because it is moving ferociously fast now. Uh, okay, we we are we're out of time. However, we've got two great questions on Twitter, so uh, let me ask them just in, in turn. And if you can give sort of like a tweet sized responses to questions that probably deserve an hour apiece. Okay. Uh, first one is from Ian Gertler and who's, he's asking, what about internet of things? Where does that fit? The, these are the user interface for internet of things, for smart cities, for your drones, for your robots, for your Uber car, uh, for your, uh, for everything. That's this why, is that's why the title is, of our book says it will change everything. And we are not kidding about that. Shell, you were going to add something quick? Robert's answer was pretty good, actually. But in my 140, this is where the humans meet the sensors. This is all this Internet of Things it has no value unless we interact with it. And that's how we're going to be doing it. OK, I love it. Where the humans meet the sensors, the new user interface for IoT. And then finally, we have a question from Karen Ganesan. I hope I've pronounced your name right. And if I haven't, I apologize who's saying the impact of these new realities on education and also higher ed, higher education, and also timing. Yeah, that one do definitely does require an hour. <laughs> uh, Caterpillar is using augmented reality glasses to teach people how to fix million dollar tractors. This is the best education technology humans have ever invented. We can teach people how to do new things in real time while they're doing them. And that is incredible. And uh, we're going to see a huge new uh, revolution in education. In education, in every aspect of learning, uh, just my my tweet side to that would be the virtual teachers in China. As much as they try to have good birth control practices, they can't produce teachers fast enough to keep up with students. So now they're experimenting with a game company on classrooms where the kids wear glasses and they customize their teachers. It can be an old teacher, a young teacher, whatever. Teacher watches the student and teaches at the pace the student learns. Student gets bored, the teacher, the virtual teacher, crea creates a pop quiz right there. Um, th this allows every pupil, for better or worse, to have a customized education at that pupil's ability to learn no faster, no slower. And you can't do that in a classroom. All right, we are out of time. And still there's one last point that I just wanted, Robert, you predicted six, eight months ago, you were the first person that I saw who predicted that Apple is going to make some type of announcement with AR, VR. Yeah, absolutely. They're coming out. I, I believe they're building a massive strategy. It comes from Steve Jobs. They did the first patents back in 2007, but the real patent for the iPhone, iPhone with a 3D sensor with pass-through uh, augmented reality uh, was done in 2011. So they've been working on this for a long time, buying tons of companies. All of that's going to come out this year in, by the end of September in their new headquarters. And we'll see when we actually get these products, but they're going to explain that there's a new Apple here and you got to uh, get on board with the new 3D map they're building, the new CDN, the new Siri, the new iPhones that are going to do mixed reality, the new glasses that are under development. We'll see if those come out at this announcement. I would assume they will. So, and if they don't, uh, you're seeing Facebook announce big announcements this week and you can see there's a, well, Zuckerberg told me personally, he's aiming at mixed reality glasses. That's, he sees that as the big prize now. And he's, he just bought a micro LED company to build optics uh, for glasses, right? So he's he's not playing around. Apple's not playing around. Google's invested half a billion dollars in Magic Leap, and they're building their own teams. So they're not playing around. Microsoft spent a, I, I don't know a billion, many billions of dollars already on Hololens, and has a thousand people working on the next version. So on and on and on. So, so if you bet against, things. if you bet against what we're betting on then you're betting against the best and brightest technology companies in the world and the best and brightest new developers in the world. But then again, Sears bet against social media. All right. And uh, I'm afraid we, we, I've learned a lot. I'll just tell you, we have another question on Twitter. I don't think we have the time to answer it, but it's a really great one. 
And Bob Wrestleman asks, says, I need to ask, what is the effect of virtual reality on intimacy between humans, parent to child, dating and marriage behavior? It's going to change it. Uh, I have a friend who already has had sex while wearing VR headsets. So uh, that's a whole nother topic and not one that Shell and I are uh, particularly, particularly adept on. <laughs> so, but that'll be something you're going to discuss discuss it south by southwest for my, I think. <laughs> my twitter answer to that is we will see and we'll see sooner not later yeah you well i'll add one thing you can create if you're a teenager and you're shy with girls you can create a virtual girl to your liking and you can have <laughs> sex with her. you want me to continue <laughs> no. <laughs> so if everybody prefers this system, I don't know what happens to the human race because we're not going to be reproducing very right. much. We've, we've moved from the sublime to the uh, we've moved to, to the sublime to the ridiculous. He yeah. asked. Well, it's not ridiculous, Michael. CNN has a program on called Beyond uh, Mostly Human already, and they found somebody who fell in love with their sex robot. So there is a change here, but it's not for your show. <laughs> yeah, falling in love with your sex robot. All right. On that note, what an interesting CXO talk this has been. We've been speaking with Robert Scoble and with Shell Israel, who are two of the most knowledgeable, knowledgeable people on the planet on the subjects of augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, the connection to artificial intelligence. Their book is The Fourth Transformation and their new consulting business, they work for brands, teaching brands how to do this stuff, is The Transformation Group. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. Robert Scoble and Shell Israel, and everybody, next week we have an amazing show. We will be speaking together with the chief privacy officer from Cisco Systems, and she will be joined by the chief information officer of the Federal Communications Commission, and we will be talking about privacy and AI in this new world. Thanks, everybody, and thanks to Livestream. Have a great one. Bye-bye.